Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. It's truly a lovely day here in Nairobi with the sun shining outside. Let me start with some macro thoughts and uh, an interview with Stanley Druckenmiller, um, who of course was George Soros' right-hand individual many years ago and uh, made a great deal of money on that very famous day um, in London. I remember it because I just arrived on the trading floor a few months before and I watched it unfold in real time. I'm not a scientist, I'm a common sense guy, Druckenmiller tells us. I just don't think you can take massive amounts of money, allocate capital to zombie companies. It just doesn't make any sense to me. He says he's not clear why the economy and the market jump so much when optimism emerges around certain drugs like remdesivir. I don't see why anybody would change their behavior because there's a viral drug out there. And that's why over the weekend I was talking about a point that we're in the realms <coughs> of behavioural economics now. Looking for a V-shaped economic recovery, not so fast, he warned. I also said a few weeks ago, a V-shaped recovery is a fantasy. Um, on the Fed's $2.3 trillion move to shore up markets in March, Druckenmiller said he found it somewhat puzzling and aggressive. And as I've said, the virus is not correlated to endogenous market dynamics, but is an exogenous uncertainty that remains unresolved. With markets, the consensus seems to be, don't worry, the Fed has your back. There's one problem with that. Our analysis says it's not true. So... Very valid points and uh, well worth looking through the uh, Twitter feed. The saliva of COVID-19 patients can harbour half a trillion virus particles per teaspoon and a cough aerosolizes it into a diffuse mist. And that is what is going to worry people about going back to work and returning to normal. Going out industries returns have obviously taken a beating. This is from Liz Ann Saunders. Um, uh, returning to the viral particles, it is estimated that as few as 1,000 SARS-CoV-2 viral particles are needed for an infection to take hold. That's from Erine Bromage. A cough, a single cough, releases about 3,000 droplets and droplets travel at 50 miles per hour. Most droplets are large and fall quickly, but many do stay in the air and can travel across a room in a few seconds. A sneeze, a single sneeze, releases about 30,000 droplets, so three times that 10,000 number with droplets travelling at up to 200 miles per hour. Most droplets are small and travel great distances easily across a room. If a person is infected, the droplets in a single cough or sneeze may contain as many as 200 million virus particles, which can all be dispersed into the environment around them. Um, as I've said previously, I'm certain we're going to enter a Great Depression. April CPI month-on-month -month fell zero, minus 0.8% um, versus minus 0.4% in the previous month. That's from Liz Ann Saunders, who's produced a very visually arresting uh, image. What's certain is that the whole global economy has been hit by an insidious, literally invisible circuit breaker. 
Home thought summer solstice celebrations at Stonehenge will not take place this year due to the coronavirus pandemic. I've always wanted to go, never went when I had the opportunity. I somehow found Madonna's Hung Up, which really is a great song. Have a listen. As I've said previously, it certainly feels like a decade of semiotic arousal when everything, it seemed, was a sign, a harbinger of some future radical disjuncture or cataclysmic upheaval. And that took me back to Gilgamesh, you gods, may I be mindful of these days and never forget them. Um, and then in the article I wrote, The Way We Live Now, you felt the land taking you back to what was there a hundred years ago, to what had been there always. Everything is barely weeks, everything is days, we have minutes to live. Gilgamesh does not linger in the garden. He at last finds Uta Napishti, the man who gazed on death and survived. Gilgamesh wants to know, how do you do this? Unhelpfully, Uta Napishti explains, no one at all sees death. No one at all sees the face of death. No one at all hears the voice of death. Death so savage who hacks men down. Ever the river has risen and brought us the flood the mayfly floating on the water, on the face of the sun its countenance gazes, then all of a sudden nothing is there. There is something karmic in this COVID-19. These are the one of the entrants in this year's big picture natural world photography competition via the Atlantic. What a photograph that is. And another one, Hippo Huddle, terrestrial wildlife finalist Botswana's Okavango River. I've always wanted to go there. An array of African wildlife congregates to eat, drink, splash and soak. This seasonal wetland was especially important in 2019 when severe drought left human and animal populations alike desperate for water. Cattle, elephants, crocodiles and other creatures were left to vie for any water they could find in the delta's shrinking pools. And then I came across this from Muchai, a surreal video of Nairobi's empty highways at night. Political reflections, Dr. Fauci was interviewed by the Senate And he said, he's damned if he does. He's damned if he doesn't about the perils of reopening the US economy too soon. Um, It's a catch-22. As I said previously, a non-linear and exponential virus represents the greatest risk to a control machine in point of fact. Sarah's CPR is quite hilarious. This was her first iteration of How to Obamagate. The second was even better. Um, See if you can find them both. This is a COVID-19 data pack, rather useful, I found. If these infection rates are accurate from ISPI, the mortality rate of coronavirus is much higher than we thought, well above 1%. How contagious and deadly is COVID-19? That's from Tony Curzon Price. And the viral moment has indeed arrived. And how? England's excess death rate is the highest in Europe amid coronavirus crisis. WHO reveals the Z-Core, that's via the sun. 
In my article over the weekend, I quoted Albert Camus. They fancied themselves free, and no one will ever be free so long as there are pestilences. In this respect, our townsfolk were like everybody else, wrapped up in themselves. In other words, they were humanists. They disbelieved in pestilences. A pestilence isn't a thing made to man's measure. Therefore, we tell ourselves that a pestilence is a mere bogey of the mind, a bad dream that will pass away. But it doesn't always pass away, does it? It's continuing and continuing. And from one bad dream to another, it is men who pass away, and the humanists first of all, because they've taken no precautions. In this article I was talking about the spillover from the developed world into emerging and frontier geographies I was saying Brazil is the global epicenter now of the coronavirus and that there we have a toxic mix of a voodoo president and a runaway COVID-19. Viruses are in essence non-linear, exponential and multiplicative and COVID-19 has escaped velocity in Brazil like it does in parts of Africa as well. I was saying Brazil is a real-time laboratory experiment and the African Jair Bolsonaro is, of course, John Pombe Magafuli. And I'll come to developments there in a moment. I was concerned about transmission hotspots in Africa, in particular Kano in Nigeria, Western Cape in South Africa, Tanzania. Um, And then I was looking at the markets as well, the dichotomy between the unemployment rate and the stock market, which was something Tavi Costa tweeted about and Stanley Druckenmiller's mentioning. I was saying tourism, I thought, was stopped out all the way through quarter four, 2021. And I was adding that business travel is toast in my view. Um, The US stock market has rebounded mightily, but this is a Venezuela or Zimbabwe trade. It's the printing of money which is driving the stock market higher. Tudor Jones, the best profit maximizing strategy is to own the fastest horse. But in a world where a lot of them are duds or they've been given an injection, it's a bit of a worry. Rubini, of course, was very sceptical about Bitcoin. Um, It crashed 15% in seven minutes on no news, a rigged, totally manipulated, Wales-controlled market where most transactions, 90% of volumes are false. As exchanges pretend to have liquidity they don't have, Massive pump and dump, spoofing, front-running, wash trading, total scam. Um, I was saying Africa will go juche, which is the North Korean ideology of self-reliance. I was saying the IMF, whom I must say have dealt with the situation with considerable finesse, something that Celestine Monger, who I follow on Twitter, was mentioning as well. Um, But nevertheless, the problems are now getting more and more intense. I said the outliers are rolling over, Zambia's on the brink of sovereign default. Um, uh, One example, rating agencies are throwing in the towel. Another devaluation looms for the Naira. And I concluded by saying regime implosion risk in sub-Saharan Africa is trending higher. This is interesting as a data point. The share of COVID-19 tests that were positive, it gives you a better sampling effect. Um, First of March, when I was looking into the origins of the COVID-19, and I remain even more convinced of what I concluded then, that there's always more to it. This is what history consists of. 
It is the sum total of the things they are telling us. What's become fascinating is to follow the folks who are defending the position. Viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics and that poses non-linear and exponential risks. Currency markets, let's have a look. Euro 108.48, dollar index just around the 100 mark. Sterling, which reported a sharp contraction, 122.85. Interestingly, the real is back at a record low of 588.66 and seems destined to vault six. Um, South African Rand 18.39. This is a chart of the dollar index. I think it's well supported because of the shortage of dollars outside the United States. Euro dollar, a lot of folks think it's going to break down. It hasn't yet. 108.47. Curious to see how this movie ends NASDAQ versus the banking index. That's from Northman Trader. Incredible divergence. The avening is complete, the natural order is restored, and Bitcoin resumes its correlation with Haas avocado prices, as was always intended. That's from Tracy Alloway, and I've written about the crypto avocado millennial economy. High-tech millennial crypto avocado economy exhibits viral wildfire and exponential and even non-linear characteristics not unlike Ebola and uh, it's reasserting that extraordinary correlation that Tracy first alerted us to. Gold right now at 1703 it's actually been for a month around these levels um, and it's girding its loins and it will get going again because as I previously said the target is above $2,000 Millions of barrels of crude oil at sea. This is from J.S. Blockland. As we move from a world of hyper-connectedness to a world of quarantine, the drop in worldwide oil consumption in April has been put as high as 35 million barrels a day. Um, and as I said then, we're now entering the twilight zone for a lot of oil producers. What I do know, know now is this, regime implosion is coming to a great number of them. Crude oil last trading at $26. India's Modi announces nearly 250 billion euros worth of stimulus to counter the COVID-19 lockdown. His management of the economy has been atrocious. Why the coming emerging markets debt crisis will be messy is a really good article in the Financial Times. The Maldives' coral-encrusted islands have long been irresistible to tourists, but today its secluded luxury resorts are deserted, except those converted into makeshift quarantine facilities for stranded coronavirus patients. The virus has shattered global tourism and devastated the Maldivian economy. The IMF has gone from projecting a 6% expansion in GDP this year to an 8% contraction. The risk is that this brutal, abrupt recession could translate into the Maldives becoming the latest country to sink into sovereign bankruptcy. Zambia, Ecuador and Rwanda have all announced in recent weeks that they are struggling to repay their debts. Lebanon has already kicked off its restructuring process, while Argentina, which was battling its creditors even before the pandemic struck, appears to be heading for its ninth sovereign default since independence in 1816. The Maldives is hardly the biggest country likely to succumb, but given its debt burden to creditors such as China and the severity of its recession, it is the poster child of how easily the dominoes will fall, warns Mitu Gulati of Duke University. Country's $250 million bond due in 2022 has tumbled to trade at 81 cents on the dollar, Zambia's even worse, 
indicating that investors are increasingly concerned about the Maldives' capacity to make good on its obligations. The kindling for another big emerging markets debt crisis has been accumulating for years. Investor demand for higher returns has allowed smaller, lesser developed and more vulnerable frontier countries to tap bond markets at a record pace in the past decade. Their debt burden has climbed from less than a trillion dollars in 2005 to 3.2 trillion, according to the Institute of International Finance, equal to 114% of GDP for frontier markets. Emerging markets as a whole owe a total of $71 trillion. The withdrawal of money from EM funds is greater and more sudden than in 2008. The economic shock is huge and the path to recovery more uncertain than it was after the last crisis. Resolving the coming debt crises may be even tougher than in the past, however. Rather than the banks and governments, the primary creditors in the mammoth debt crisis that wrecked the developing world in the 1980s and 1990s, creditors are nowadays largely a multitude of bond funds. Having watched some holdout creditors extract rich payouts, even some of the traditional institutional investors appear to be reconsidering the virtues of passivity. In 2016, Elliott Management's Jay Newman etched his name in the annals of big hedge fund halls by extracting $2.4 billion from Argentina for the firm after a decade-long legal battle. Holding out long seemed like a cat-and-mouse game that was costly and uncertain, but now it has shifted to a more promising strategy. One lawyer who has worked with creditors points out that many investment funds have piled into EM bonds in recent years, and the prospect of deep and broad losses could be ruinous to some heavily exposed funds. Before, the holdouts were the main problem, but now it could be the traditional funds, he says. If your back is against the wall, you're going to fight. These dictate that if a large majority of bondholders vote for restructuring, typically 75%, the agreement is imposed on all holders. But investors have wised up buying bigger chunks of specific bonds in an attempt to amass such a large position that they enjoy a de facto veto over the restructuring terms of the instruments, and some older bonds have no such clauses. Franklin Templeton, which managed to extract what some analysts say were surprisingly favourable terms in Ukraine's 2015 debt restructuring, having snapped up enough bonds to become the country's largest private creditor. The interests we represent are those of the millions of individuals and thousands of financial advisors and institutions who have entrusted their money to us to invest on their behalf. They don't want to be Elliot, but they have a fiduciary duty, and for some of them it will be existential, so they might as well fight to the death, says the creditor lawyer. Clinching a victory, however, is another story, says one holdout investor. Massing a blocking stake gets you a seat at the table, but it doesn't tell you when you will be eating. Instead, they say the coming wave of debt crises will have to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Trebish says the proposal may be acceptable to China, which has edged out the IMF and the World Bank as the largest official creditor to developing economies via its Belt and Road Initiative, according to data compiled with Harvard's Carmen Reinhardt and economist Sebastian Horn. If things really blow up, China might prefer this option to an outright default. This pandemic will quickly escalate from a health crisis to a humanitarian crisis and ultimately to a solvency crisis, Mr. Mined wrote in a recent note to clients. Political stability will be the last domino to fall, but my biggest concern is that this crisis will be much deeper and more prolonged than people anticipate, which leaves a lot of space for another shoe to drop in the global financial crisis. So as I said, tourism, I believe, is stopped out through quarter four 2021, hitting places like the Maldives, 
With respect to China, I wrote about that in an article, The End of Vanity, and I said, you know, it has been the defining engagement of the last two decades for sub-Saharan Africa. But basically, China has an option to buy in sub-Saharan African assets at fire sale prices. 19th of April, I was saying the Eurobond market is now shut for the foreseeable future to sub-Saharan African sovereigns. I was asking on the 22nd of March, how much do we need to haircut remittances? Uh, where I also said I calculate Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole will contract. Um, 2nd of March, I was calling it a perfect storm. 9th of December last year, I was saying it's time to big up the dosage of quaaludes. And 2nd of September, I was talking, last year I was talking about the China Emerging Markets Frontier Feedback Loop phenomenon. And I said this phenomenon was positive for the last two decades but has now undergone a trend reversal. The RAND is the purest proxy for this phenomenon. African countries heavily dependent on China being the main taker are also at the bleeding edge of this phenomenon. And I said this pressure point will not ease soon, but will continue to intensify. And 10th of May, I was talking about the regime implosion risk in sub-Saharan Africa trending higher, something that Scott Minet was mentioning. Sub-Saharan Africa, as I said in my last article, will go juche. Juche is self-reliance and is the official ideology of North Korea. 53 African Union member states reporting 68,102 cases, 2,340 deaths and 23,307 recoveries. But look at the trend on those two graphs. <clears throat> I called it the spillover moment in my last article, and prior to that, on the 2nd of March, I said, we know coronavirus is exponential, non-linear, and multiplicative, and we know that it grows like nothing, 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 then cluster, 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 then boom. As I said, the African Jair Bolsonaro is, of course, John Pombe Magafuli. Uh, Zito Cabways asks, don't keep your people in the dark, take the nation into your confidence and start to lead. The future of so many lives depends on it. It's been 13 days since the Tanzanian government briefed the country on the coronavirus situation. Meanwhile, positive COVID cases are stacking up at the Tanzanian border points with Kenya. Kabwe, again, Magafuli, isn't providing leadership during the pandemic. He is hiding in his home village. He has failed as a leader, and the country isn't moving forward. The worrying development is transmission hotspots. The question for Sub-Saharan Africa is whether these transmission hotspots expand and conflate. Kano, Western Cape, uh, Tanzania were the three places I mentioned. We are not sure the number of, of the number of deaths on a daily basis, but there are many. This is in Al Jazeera, uh, estimating that the daily death toll in Dar es Salaam was no less than 30 to 40. Omari, a motorcycle taxi driver, stopped outside a house in Arusha, a tourist hub in northern Tanzania, pointed to a large grey gate. A person here died from COVID a few days ago, he said. He slows down at another house and loudly mumble through his blue protective mask. The father here drives the bus between Arusha and Dar es Salaam. He picked up COVID in Dar, and he died a week ago. Hussein Kwikima said when he visited the Department of Health at the Ilala Municipal Council on April 30 to discuss the burial, he saw the worker on duty open a book titled Mazishi Ya COVID-19, Swahili for COVID-19 burials, and that his father was the 256th name in the book. Similarly, mystery deaths in Nigeria provoke fear of unrecorded coronavirus surge. Nigeria has tested just 27,000 samples, compared with about 356,000 tests in South Africa, which has a population less than a third of the size. However, they said we have coronavirus, look at us, she said in Hausa, according to Vanguard newspaper, do we look sick? Do you see any sign of sickness in us? Look at us very well and see. Late last month in Kano State, 
Gravediggers told local media they were burying far more bodies than usual, despite few officially confirmed cases of the virus. And just as the government laboratory conducted COVID-19 tests in the state after staff tested positive. South African all shares down 11.85% year-to-date. Dollar Rand at 18.36. Egyptian Pound at 15.7498. EGX 30 minus 24.16%. Nigerian all share minus 11.72%. Ghana Stock Exchange minus 8.15%. This is the pyramid of Denkur in South Sudan built by the Nua prophet Gundeng in the 1890s a key symbol of newer resistance to British rule. The monument was dynamited on the orders of colonial officer Percy Coriat in 1928, shortly after he took his, this photograph. Mir Thaka, imagine, that's a bigger headline. This is referencing the Daily Nation. For these people, rather than Kemri not having money to conduct testing, the Republic of Kenya IMF Country Report number 20 backslash 156 request for disbursement under the Rapid Credit Facility press release staff report and statement by the Executive Director for the Republic of Kenya. The impact of COVID-19 on the Kenyan economy will be severe. It will act through both global and domestic channels and downside risks remain large. To ensure that COVID-19 related resources are used for their intended purpose, the authorities plan to conduct independent post-crisis auditing of COVID-19 related expenditures and publish the results. Kenya is facing a pronounced economic slowdown and an urgent balance of payments need owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. The central bank should also continue to allow the exchange rate to act as a shock absorber. Staff projects that real GDP growth will drop to 0.8% in 2020. I think it will be negative. With international financial markets effectively closed to emerging market and frontier issuers such as Kenya, staff expects an external financing gap of about $2.1 billion in 2020. Similar to previous years, public investment execution was less than budgeted due to inadequate control of spending commitments Payment arrears of about 0.6% of GDP accumulated. GDP rose, GDP debt rose to 62.4% of GDP in June 2019. The main channels of impact include one, a sharp slowdown in the traditionally resilient services sector, concentrated in tourism, transport, and wholesale retail, severe disruptions of supply chains lower agricultural exports, in particular tea and flowers, and activity in the agro-processing sector due to transport disruptions and reduced global demand. The external impact would be strongest on tourism receipts in the financial account. Current account deficit is expected to narrow to 4.4% of GDP in 2020. The resulting balance of payments financing need is assessed to be some $2.1 billion. 2.1% of GDP. Domestic risks include a stronger than expected negative impact of the locust invasion on agriculture production, weaker remittances, and a more than severe, a more than a more severe than expected impairment of bank balance sheets due to the expected 2020 slowdown, which would limit banks' ability to support economic growth. Authorities view the outlook as more positive than staff. They expected growth in 2020 to be around 3%, um, buoyed by the agricultural sector and some services such as communication and information technology. Kenya's debt remains sustainable. The risk of debt distress has moved to high from moderate. Mohamed Welie signaled this a couple of days ago due to the impact of the global COVID-19 crisis, which exacerbated existing vulnerabilities. There are breaches of one solvency ratio indicator, the present value of external debt to exports ratio, and one liquidity indicator, the external debt service to exports ratio, above the thresholds under the baseline scenario. Kenya's bilateral debt, about 72% is owed to non-Paris club members, mainly due to loans from China to finance the construction of the standard gauge railway. 
Kenya's reliance on commercial financing has increased commercial debt, mainly eurobonds and syndicated loans, accounted for about 33% of external public debt. Public sector um, debt is projected to incre increase from 61.7% to 69.9% in 2022. Tax revenues have gradually declined since 2013-2014 as a share of GDP, reaching their lowest level in the past 10 years in 2017-2018. This, this DSA finds that Kenya's risk of debt distress has moved to high from moderate in the context of the ongoing global economic turmoil associated with COVID-19. China imports via the Port of Mombasa down by 20% in quarter 1 2020, that's via Brookings, via uh, Sewe. An Ethiopian zoo anti-aircraft missile brought down the Kenyan plane that crashed in the town of Badale last week. The incident began with the incoming plane aborting a landing attempt because an Ethiopian military vehicle was on the runway. Officials say that's via Haroon Maruf. Kenya shilling at 106.50, Nairobi all share minus 16.22% and the NSE 20 minus 23.18%. Thank you for listening.